I am really, really sorry that we are talking about coffee shop evangelism and you don't have coffee. Yeah. Which is, uh, I am Scottish and cappuccino, yeah. I, I, I am Scottish, I wanted to do a, I, I wanted to teach a course on malt whiskey evangelism, but we haven't quite advanced there yet, so we'll, we will see. Um, what I intend to do with this is just to give you some kind of hopefully stimulus and ideas about reaching out to people. The whole thing, this is about evangelism. How do you communicate the good news? So let's ask, first of all, what, what do we mean by coffee shop evangelism or coffee shop culture? What is coffee shop culture? Let's go on to that. Um, it's, coffee shop culture is a phenomenon that for some of you in different countries, you're going, hey, what are you talking about? We've had it for years. But in, in my culture, it's relatively new. And it's come for three reasons. Number one, um, people like to meet together. And they used to meet together in pubs. And some still do. But pubs have become actually more difficult to meet in, partly because of noise, partly because of problems associated with drunkenness and so on. And sitting having a cup of coffee seems more cultured. Then there's the Starbucks Costa Coffee uh, phenomenon where it's just mega cool to pay a fortune for a coffee that you could make a lot cheaper at your own home. But anyway, that's the way it is. It's, it's part of the culture that we're in. And then in my culture, which is Scotland, which as you all know is a tropical uh, subclimate, um, it's, they ban smoking indoors. And all of a sudden, there have been lots of cafes out on the streets, even in February in Scotland just so that people can smoke. And what you're finding is, it seems to me that there's new coffee shops opening up every month in, in our city. It seems a, you know, paninis and coffee. Um, and in, in a lot, I, I don't think I've been in any European city where the, the, the idea of just sitting around having a cup of coffee is, uh, isn't something very important. Um, first time I went to the Netherlands, I loved it. Uh, though. <laughs> Um, going to Amsterdam and asking for a coffee shop uh, wasn't culturally all that sensitive um, because as those, most of you probably know, the last thing you'll get in Amsterdam in a coffee shop is coffee. That's where you get your drugs uh, with this ridiculously thick black coffee as well. Don't ask me how I know all this. Um, but uh, I, was, I was thinking about that actually today because the coffee that we get at the coffee break here, I'm sorry, but it's what my Dutch friends would call Kinder Cafe. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's dishwater, <laughs> you know, sorry. Um, but people do like, I mean, coffee is a drug and people like it. I love coffee. I, I used to drink six to eight cups uh, uh, a day before I got ill. I still like coffee. I First thing I do when I get in the morning is I have coffee. And I do like having coffee with other people. So coffee shop culture is really saying it's one of the major points that people will, will meet in Gavin Street. Let's go for a coffee. Uh, I, in my own church, I have an office. But I also have five other offices. There's the Tartan Cafe, the Sicilian Cafe, Starbucks, Costas, and another uh, couple of cafes where I just meet with people. A lot of pastoral care gets taken in that context. Why do people, I just want to look at why do people actually go to coffee shops? So I mentioned the one uh, in Amsterdam. Why do they go? Well, the obvious answer is to say people go to drink coffee. Not really. As I say, you can make coffee a lot cheaper. And if you're a coffee connoisseur, you can get it made better for yourself at home. But I mean, you do go, I, I guess you, you, you want a cup of coffee or something. Uh, the main reason though that people go is company. People want company. And also what I would just call cool. It's kind of cool to hang out at a coffee shop. You know, um, in some parts of English culture, they would have a tea shop. You know, now for me, there's one just down the road from the church with us, and it's you know wee little china teacups and little old ladies sitting around knitting and talking and discussing flowers and Jane Austen. That's not cool for me, but going to a coffee shop and saying something like I'll have a double mocha latte, whatever, you know, skinny with you know, just it, I don't know. It just seems like you're on Friends and television or something that you're you know you're just mega cool. So people like the idea. I mean, I'm amazed that there are people who drink alone. They go to a coffee shop, 
They buy an expensive cup of coffee and they sit by themselves and they drink alone. I do it. And why? Part of it is the cool thing. Part of it is nice. It's a nice atmosphere. Part of it is the coffee itself. Uh, it depends which one you go to. can actually be quite nice. So I think people go for company and that is important. And, and it's also okay to be seen in a coffee shop, which is also quite important. There are an awful lot of people for whom to be seen in a church is just no way. Church is like mega uncool. And there's no way that they are going to go. But if you ask them to come, I've done this, I've done Bible studies in coffee shops that people will come to when they wouldn't come to my church to do a Bible study. Let's go on to the next one. The best time. When's the best time to reach people? I would normally not hold an outreach event for students at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay? Uh, because they don't know what that time really is. Uh, so you would, you know, if I was if I was wanting to reach younger people, I might do it in the evening. Um, if I'm wanting to reach working people, if I do it in the evening, I would do it in the early evening to catch people as they're because I live in a city to catch people before they they go home rather than ask them to go home and then come back into the centre of the city. Uh, young mothers sometimes, if their children are at a, a, a nursery, a creche or at a primary school, then morning's a great time. Sometimes it will depend on the coffee shop itself, because sometimes there are shops that are really, really busy, they don't want you there, but there are times when they're really quiet, and they'll really appreciate the extra custom that you bring in. So you think about, you've got to think about who you're trying to reach and what is the best time. I want to do a Christianity Explored, I'll do that in the evening normally. I want to... Uh, reach working people, I'll either do it in the evening or if I'm going for men and the coffee shop's open early enough, I'll do something like a coffee breakfast, uh, you know, croissants and coffee or, or whatever and maybe do a, a meeting in that. What's, what's the advantages of coffee shop apologetics or we don't like the term apologetics. What's the advantages of trying to communicate the gospel? in that kind of atmosphere. There are advantages and disadvantages. The, the advantages, the main advantage is it's incredibly open. People can come in and go. It's, it's, in, it's incredibly free. Um, that's also, for a lot of Christians, that's a disadvantage because we, we like to know how things are going to go. And it's really quite unnerving setting up a meeting if you're not sure who is going to come to it. I think another advantage is, is quite connected. Uh, we'll show you uh, a video clip later on. But I uh, did one up in uh, one of the small towns in the north of Scotland. And what the local church did was they went to a local coffee shop. They bought over the coffee shop for the evening. They said, can we just have it for the meeting? The, the owner and the staff came in and served coffee and cake and so on. And then lots of people came. And the majority of the people who came to that event were people who would not go near a church. They knew it was a church event. They knew it was organized by the local minister. They, they knew I was going to give them a talk about Christianity. But it was an environment which they felt very at home at. And although they may not have felt at home in the subject, they felt at home with the environment. And that's actually a big deal, because when someone comes into your church who doesn't know anything about Christianity, they, their environment is... The environment is very, very strange for them. So for me, that, that's one of the huge advantages. It also depends the kind of meeting that you do. If you do a closed meeting, you're inviting particular people. If you're allowed to, if a coffee shop allows you to do this, an open meeting, and I've done this in larger ones, where what you do is um, you set up a, a meeting, you have a microphone and so on. Everyone who comes in to get a coffee is actually going to hear what you're going to say but they've not come in to hear you. So that can actually be quite annoying. I remember a lady came in to one event I did in, in a Borders bookstore where it was a, a, I think it was Starbucks coffee shop and I had the microphone and so on and she bought her coffee, uh, she bought her cappuccino and she had her Danish and she sat down and as soon as I started speaking, I saw the look in her face which was kind of, oh no, what have I come into I came to get a coffee. I didn't come to hear some guy talk about God and religion and so on. And 
I could see that she was thinking of getting up and walking out. But we're Scottish and we have a reputation. And she'd spent the money already. So, so I kind of knew I had her. She was stuck. She, she had to finish it, you know, and it was hot and she couldn't just gulp it down. So she stayed. But what she did was, it was hilarious, because she went and she sat way over in the corner, folded her arms, and kind of made it, I am not listening to you. Now, here's the golden rule. When you try not to listen to someone, you'll listen to them. It's impossible. In fact, sometimes I think reverse psychology in church, that's what I want to do. I want to say, don't listen to me. You just carry on, do whatever you want. I don't want you to listen to me. I think people are maybe more inclined even to listen. It's, I don't know, it's kind of a weird thing with human beings. But she sat way over in the corner, and bit by bit, I could see she was changing. Until at the end, she was sitting right down at the very, very front. And she was straight in with questions. She told me at the end, she, thought was, she said, I would, I would never have come near anything like this. Now, that's the advantage of doing an open one. But um, we'll see some disadvantages um, in a moment. So I want to talk about quench and, and what we do. These advantages of the public uh, meeting space. Now, I've already mentioned the number one advantage is it's neutral. It's not your territory. It's not their territory either, but it's not yours. I've seen people who have asked to come to a talk. They've come, and I said to them, do you know, if I'd invited you to my church, would you have come? And they said, no way. Why not? Because they think our agenda is to try and get them into church, to try and join our organization, to try and... They're, they're open enough. They have to be open enough to want to discuss and ask questions. If, if you can convince people that this is genuinely neutral, then you will be on a winner with some people. So that's, I think, the biggest advantage. Let me ask about how to organize, how we organize these different events. And I, we've written a, a book, Quench, Cafe Culture Evangelism. You can get it down in the bookstore. We advert four euros, ridiculous price, where most of what I've got uh, in this talk it, a lot of it is, well, is, is in there. And I like alliteration, so I always say three things. If someone phones and says, will you come and do a, a, a cafe outreach for us? Because we hear that's what you do. We call it quench. Um, why will, how will you do it? And I say to them, well, I need three things from you. I need, first of all, you've got to promise that you will pray. That's really, really important. Right from the beginning, you have to pray. The second thing that you really have to do is you do have to prepare. I've done loads and loads of these kind of cafe type events and only two or three have been pretty disastrous. And one was in Northern Ireland where I turned up. First of all, they made a mistake. They had it in the church. Secondly, the biggest mistake they made was they didn't invite anybody. They just announced it from the church. And it was just such a disastrous meeting. It was so embarrassing uh, in lots of ways. Not because of the numbers. I've done, don't worry about numbers with a, ca a cafe thing because I've done a cafe outreach with four or five people. And it's been wonderful because the interaction's been fabulous. But it was just, they didn't prepare. They didn't invite people. So you've got to pray. You've got to prepare properly. You've got to think about where you're doing it, who you're trying to reach. And you have to publicize and do good publicity with it. Two different formats. General publicity, which is things like posters, leaflets, and so on. But for me, even more important is either small A5 leaflets or small cards which people in your church, and you can have, to personally invite people. The vast majority of people come to things because they're invited to them. There are very few things that people go to just because they see it advertised. If I hear that Van Morrison is coming to Dundee, okay, I will go. If I hear that, you know, Joe Bloggs, who I've never heard of as a band, are coming, I, I might, not even, it might not even register with me. But if somebody says to me, Dave, I heard this band. They are the most amazing band you've ever heard in your life. Would you like to come? Okay. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'll go with it. And an awful lot of people, they won't walk along the street, look at a poster and say, coffee shop, um, you know, we, make, we do all kinds of subjects. Uh, one that did actually attract a lot of people was I did one on sex in the city uh, from a Christian perspective. But most will just look at it and think, oh, I'm not going to that. Why would I go to that? But if a friend invites, so you need good publicity so that people uh, can invite them. And I would ask that if you, if you organize this kind of thing, look for people in your church or people you know who, who are good designers. 
It's usually better to design your own stuff. If you don't, if you can't, then ask around. If you're actually serious about doing this as well, feel free to ask us because we've uh, designed a few things that we use. Okay, what's the best format of how to do this? There are different ways that you can, you can organize uh, an event like this. Number one, the, the most usual way that, that I would do it is have a speaker for about 20 minutes on a particular subject. Advertise the subject. The speaker's not that important. Big name Christian speakers are not big name anywhere. You know, so why would they go? You know, um, but the big thing is, you know, you advertise the subject and so on. You have someone speak for 20 minutes, and then you'd have questions and answers and discussion. Now, that works if you've got 15 to 20 people at least, and you can do more than that. I've done it. I did one in Chelmsford, England, where they took over the local Costas and they sold tickets and over 150 people came. So that was an interesting one because that was packed. Uh, I've done others where there's been just four or five and that's been quite difficult. You have to think about, are you taking over the whole coffee shop? Are you just having a meeting as part of it? You obviously have to get permission from the owners and so on. Uh, I, for an alpha course, there was a, a local uh, church just outside Glasgow that asked me if I'd come and start their alpha course. And I said, can you please do it in a cafe or a restaurant or a bar? And they said, no, we don't know any. And then they said, oh, yes, we do. The local hotel owner comes to the church. So they just hired his restaurant, or he gave it, actually, for the evening. They actually had a meal and coffee and so on. And then I gave a talk, and then there were questions. And then afterwards, people signed up for the course. And a lot of people did sign up for it. So you can do it as a... Uh, an open thing that anyone can come to. You can do it as a special invite thing. You can, uh, I think you've always got to have a speaker or a singer. We've done it, I've done it twice with a jazz band, which was really, really interesting. But if you have musicians, both speaker and musicians, make sure they're good. It's really embarrassing if you've got a rubbish speaker and it's really embarrassing if you've got rubbish musicians. In terms of speaking, <clears throat> let's think about how to speak at these kind of events. And people say a speaker, well, let's ask the local minister or the local pastor. I'm, I'm not convinced with that. It depends. Because one of the things you need to be able to do to speak at these events is they work best if they're interactive. If people can interrupt, if people can say things. So your speaker needs to be able to think on their feet. Your speaker needs to be... Um, able to connect with people. If someone just stands up and reads a lecture, forget it. And also, if they stand up and yell at people or preach at them, forget it. That's not going to work. So your speaker needs to be quite articulate and be quite flexible. Let's uh, think about what we do in terms of follow-up. That, again, is really, really important. You do a cafe event, you are rarely going to see lots of people saying, I'd like to become a Christian. Please, can I come and bow the knee? in front of the cappuccino machine and profess faith in Jesus. It's just not going to... I've seen it once, but it's rarely, rarely going to happen. But what's going to happen is this. Somebody like me as a speaker will come, will talk, remove what Tim Keller calls defeater beliefs, and then say, if you are interested in finding out more about this, the people who organized this, that man there, these people here, they can introduce you to Jesus. And if you'd like to find out more, and having things like an alpha course, Christianity Explored, a follow-up event, information about your church, lots of different things like that is really, really important because your coffee shop thing is kind of like a taster. It's kind of like an advert. And you're, what the, the purpose of a speaker like me is to stimulate people and to provoke people, to provoke them so that they don't hit me, but, you know, to provoke them. I want to find out more. I want to know more. And that is really, it's, it's almost like pre-evangelism. I've done, I did a meeting once and one of the elders was really upset because we didn't have a prayer, a Bible reading, we didn't have a song, and we didn't have an altar call. And he was upset. And yet, at that particular one, there was over 200 people. And he was stunned that more than half of them were non-Christians. Because the format suited them because they didn't feel threatened. He thought evangelism was having a particular kind of service. I would argue a huge amount of what we're doing here is pre-evangelism. It's trying to stimulate, trying to provoke people, trying to get them to answer questions or ask questions. Some pitfalls. First is, 
nobody turns up. Oh well, you live another day. You know, that's my life. Doing seminars like this, I mean, here I am, it's four o'clock on a Monday afternoon, there's a wonderful swimming pool, on a Sunday afternoon, there's a wonderful swimming pool just down there. It's actually not raining at the moment. I could have turned up here and nobody would be here. You can go ahead and organize an event and you, you don't know who's going to turn up. Now, I need to, to stress this, this is really important. So often, I'll get a minister who organized an event, ask me to come, and about a week before, they begin to panic that no one's going to turn up. So what do they do? They phone all their Christian friends and all their colleagues and others, please tell people to come to this meeting. And as a result, you will get a meeting that may be full, but it's packed out with Christians, which is A, quite intimidating for non-Christians, and B, defeats the purpose of what you were trying to do. We weren't trying to hold a Christian meeting. We were trying to reach non-Christians. If nobody turns up, you've lost. Fine, just get on and, and, and do it again, uh, or do it in a different way. Do it at a different time. You never know until you try how it works out. So don't pack it out uh, with Christians. One church I know was absolutely amazing. What they did, this was a church in England, they invited me down, they hired a hotel, they charged people five pounds a head, which was crazy. But it's funny, when people pay for things, they value them more. And they also think they've earned a right with certain things. So I've learned that charging is not such a bad idea. Um, they charge people five pounds a head for which they got a coffee and a cake. And then this talk, they also said to their own members in their church, you cannot come unless you buy two tickets. And one of the tickets has to be for a non-Christian friend. And they ended up having to expand the whole meeting because they, over a, a hundred people came. Because the people in the church caught the vision of it. So, you know, that's one thing. No one turns up. Um, only Christians turn up. I've mentioned that already. Uh, it's practical things like the sound doesn't work. Uh, make sure you usually need, unless it's in a very small setting, like here I don't need a microphone, but you usually need a microphone in most modern environments. If you're going to do that, make sure someone has got sound that actually works and don't test it five minutes before you're due to start. That's always the bad thing. Um, another thing that can go wrong is you can get heckled. Um, I, I'm not sure how you would say that in whatever language you speak, but heckled basically means people shout at you and interrupt you. Now at a personal level, I love that. Uh, the fact that we are filming this and you're not allowed to heckle me just now is a very dis great disappointment to me. But I do love being heckled. I, love, I, I started in a pub in a place called Kirkcaldy. Uh, there was about 20 people who'd come specifically for the meeting, and there was about 30 people who came, had come in to have a meal. There was a man sitting eating his fish and chips, and I drinking his pint, and I started speaking, and about two minutes in, he just stopped, banged his pint down, and said, that's rubbish. And I said, well, look, I'd said I'd talk for 15 minutes, and we'd have questions, but let's forget the 15 minutes. Come on, sir, why is it rubbish? And we began, and then someone else started up, no, 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 no. And then we had the most stimulating hour and a half. It was fantastic. I mean, it was absolutely, sick. if you can get people to interact, it's wonderful. So, Heckling can be bad if someone's just there to cause trouble, but heckling when someone wants to ask, they, they just get so caught up with what you're saying that they want to ask. It really is wonderful. Uh, I'll finish off by just going through one or two other things about coffee. Uh, Starbucks in the church, should you have uh, a church coffee shop? Yeah, if you are sure that you can attract non-Christians. If it's only going to become an alternative Christian coffee shop for people who go to church, that defeats the purpose. I don't see the point of that. Let me put, say in passing that for those of you, and this is a really good idea, who after your morning service or your evening service have tea and coffee, make sure you do it and make sure you have wonderful tea and coffee and great bacon because that will attract people. You know, I'm sorry, but it's very mercenary. But uh, do not serve instant coffee in plastic cups uh, just you know, to people who are used to getting a much higher quality. It's worth paying for the extra quality of coffee in churches. But a separate church coffee shop, only if you can get the staff, only if you can be pretty sure that non-Christians will come, and only if you're on a high street uh, where people will pass by. Go to the next one. Um, real or instant? Well, I've mentioned that already. Uh, instant coffee is an anathema. It is almost blasphemy. Uh, do not do it. Uh, uh, seriously, I just thought, no. I, I, I have a friend who refuses to go and speak at American church conferences because he says all they ever have is instant coffee and he insists they buy in Starbucks or something. So 
do, do whatever you do, do it quality. That's really what I'm trying to say. The last thing is just simply, why should we bother? Um, I mentioned the book, and I just want to say something about why we bother with this. Here's why we bother. Because people are genuinely lost, and they need to hear about Christ. And who knows, but something that they hear or see in a coffee shop from you and your church may be the spark that the Holy Spirit uses to bring them to faith. I have seen that. Now, I, I do have to say you have to be incredibly patient. There was a statistic, and like 82% of statistics, they're all made up. No. <laughs> um, there was a statistic that said, in the United Kingdom, from the time of first hearing the gospel to professing faith, the average time is seven years. I don't know how you work that out and whether that's true, but I do know this, that in general, the day of going into a place Speaking the gospel and having someone say, I'd love to become a Christian. That is largely not there because they don't have the background, they don't have the understanding, they don't know who Jesus is. But you're provoking interest and so on. I did have, I remember one German girl, uh, after she heard us at a cafe, uh, an outreach event, she said very simply, she wrote me immediately and she said, when you spoke, something in my heart moved. She was very poetic. You know, something moved. And it was all very new age and romantic and so on. She wasn't talking about me. She was talking about when I heard about Jesus and I'd like to find out more. For me, that's, that's what I'm aiming for, to try and get people to find out more. So I really want to encourage you to think about doing this. I'm not, it, it is not easy. It really is not easy. But uh, it is so worth doing. And the great thing is anyone can do it. Any church, small church can do it. It doesn't take a huge amount.